Hello, I am Andrei Namuratu and I'm a senior researcher at the European Commission Joint Research Center. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk to you today about the frameworks and tools that we have developed for teachers and lecturers at school education level, secondary education and higher education. So just to tell you a little bit about the Joint Research Center, we are the in-house science service of the European Commission. I always say that our main task is to carry out research and then disseminate it and publish it in the format of reports, policy briefs that can then be used by the European Commission policy officers themselves to create policies for the European Union, but also by member states, by ministries of education, ministries of employment, by education institutions, by academics, by anyone who wants to engage with our research to inform their decisions. So I'm going to tell you some about some of the competence frameworks and tools that we have developed at the GRC. We have tools and frameworks for individuals, for professionals, and for organizations. So for individuals, we have, for example, the GCOMP. That was the first tool that we have developed in 2013. Actually, it's not a tool, it's a framework because it presents the theoretical background of what digital competence means. No? And now, just now in, 2000, uh, in 2022, we have released least a new version of it, version 2.2 of the GCOMP uh, framework, which is an important work and is the groundwork for all the other frameworks that we have. We also have, for example, GCOMP for consumers, for consumers to know better, you know, how to engage online when they're doing shopping, when they are um, engaging with social media and websites in terms of data protection and other aspects they should think about. We have the Entercomp, which is the entrepreneurial entrepreneurship uh, competence framework. Life Comp, the competences for life. You know? So what are the main competences that one need? The social skills, uh, so on and so forth. And the Green Comp, which is an important and very new uh, competence framework um, and it's about this green transition that we are all uh, trying and make nowadays. So important for us to look after the environment. No? Then we have frameworks for professionals. Decompedu is one of the frameworks that I'm going to zoom into today. No? Uh, and it's, it's a framework for educators. It's the digital competence uh, framework for educators at all levels. And then coming from the Decompedu framework, we have a tool called Selfie for Teachers. Okay. Selfie for Teachers is a tool based on the framework. Selfie for Teachers is a tool focusing um, on, on the primary education sector and on the secondary education sector. So if you are an educator working in either of the sectors, this tool is for you. If you work in the higher education sector, your tool is called Checking, Checking Tool, also based on the GCOMP Edu framework, but focusing on higher education. I'll show you this tool in a minute. Then we have tools, um, we have frameworks and tools for organizations. So we have the GCOMP org, which is a framework developed to help organizations and organizations um, understand their level, their maturity level of digital competence. And out of this framework, we've developed a tool, which is the selfie tool. Many schools in Europe nowadays use this tool. And finally, we have the Open and Do framework, the, a framework that I had the pleasure to be the main author, which is about open education. So it tells you what it means. Um, to be an open educator, what open education is about. And although it was developed for the higher education sector, it can be used across sectors. So frameworks are there to, prov to provide a starting point for us to think and discuss, you know, for us to think about certain areas, certain topics, and engage with them, adapt them, reuse them in different ways to serve our own contexts. I must also say that all of these frameworks have been developed not only by us researchers in the European Commission, but with the involvement of many different stakeholders from ministries, from other international organizations, teachers, students, schools, universities, academics, so that, and other European Commission policy officers. So there are many, many, many different types of stakeholders giving feedback and help us build and construct these frameworks for you. Okay. Now, Today, as I said, I'm going to zoom into the digital competence framework for educators and also the Open Edu framework. And we've also developed guidelines for academics based on the Open Edu framework. Now, I wanted to show you now a video, which I think is very interesting because it shows that open education is a very widespread 
concept globally. No, it's not something about free marketplace uh, or anything like that. It's something about inclusion, about being more open, about um, giving people the possibility to learn, even if they are open learners, not formally registered in the university. So from the moment you start sharing your resources, no, either as a course or as an open educational resource, you start becoming part of this movement called open education. So we've recorded this video a few years ago in an open education conference and uh, it's very interesting to see um, how international it is. Open education, what does it mean? It's a broad concept, multidisciplinary, many ways, many dimensions to change learning and education in our way, in our future for the society. We need new ways to opening up education and quality is key for it. Open education for me is about inclusiveness. And I think the open movement should be more inclusive to other sectors than just higher education. We're entering a period of time when people are going to need to change jobs very rapidly and reskill on a constant basis. And so open educational resources offer them the opportunity to access the information they need. So right now what I'm just really excited about and what I've heard just continuously is the conversations that are happening around pedagogy and how we can use open pedagogy and open practice to really improve student learning around the world. And I feel like we're at an inflection point with this movement and we're on the cusp of really making what we have all been working so hard to happen. And so for me, it's just incredibly exciting and it's incredibly exciting to be part of this community. We are also developing a uh, special interest group in open educational practices. And with their work in group, we can then advocate strongly open educational practices in Australia. In fields including technology, medicine and other areas, knowledge is developing so rapidly that uh, people can't possibly keep up with the current state of uh, knowledge development and so having access to open educational resources allows them to access just-in-time information. I just would like to thank the Euro European Commission about the work they are doing in developing policies for open educational practices in Europe because that work is informing my work in developing policies for higher education in Australia. So, um this uh, is an interesting video on open education, you know, showing um, how the different perspectives, there are people talking about quality, others talking about open pedagogy. So I think it really help, helps us open up our own mindset to what it means, uh, open education, what, what, what open education means. Because if you think right now, what does it mean to you, you know? Um, Different people have different answers to that question. And this is why we needed to have a, a kind of a working definition of open education that I'm going to show you to facilitate, you know, to facilitate policy making, to facilitate conversations, to be a starting point uh, for us to have a common understanding of what open education is, right? So the Open Edu Framework uh, comes um, uh, as a, the result of, of a three-year research project at the European Commission, um, exactly with this goal to present what open education is, a working definition for it. It has been developed focusing on higher education, but it can be very easily adapted to be used in other education sectors, such as uh, primary education or secondary education. And I leave you um, the, the, the access, the URL for you to access. And just as a reminder, all those frameworks that I showed you in the beginning can be accessed, accessed online. They are all published online, free of charge, you can download, you can print, you can engage with them, and also the tools are available online. It's just a matter of using a search, a search engine, putting their names, writing JRC, and it is going to take you straight forward to all these frameworks and tools, okay? Now, let's zoom into this, this graphic, you know, that represents the 10 dimensions of open education that we were talking about. So open education, as we said, means different things to different people. No? So here we have the internal dimensions. Uh, we have the core dimensions in the inside of the graphic and then the supporting dimensions uh, in the outside of the graphics. So if I ask you, where are MOOCs 
where do you think MOOCs are in this graphic? You no, know, in the in terms of the ten dimensions. Or where are the open educational resources? Those resources that are licensed with an open license, such as Creative Commons. Where are they? Where do they fit in this in this graphic? You no. Know? So you may say, Andrea, OERs, open educational resources, belong to content, and MOOCs. Well, MOOCs perhaps belong to content or technology. So now you see, I think this is the interesting thing. Yes, but they are transversal. Um, one of the aspects that I would like you to understand is that the, these dimensions, they talk to each other. No, they actually are transversal. So you can be talking about MOOCs and fitting MOOCs into pedagogy. It's a different way of teaching. No, it's more open. It's via video, for example. It can give you micro-credentials and you can attach um, credits from the European Credit Transfer System, ECTS, to them, so they would also be involved in the recognition dimension. They depend on technology, you no, know, because they, there's normally a platform behind. It's about collaboration between students, peer review of, co of coursework in MOOCs or different teachers and lecturers collaborating to design a MOOC, um, and then this all the, the video uh, team, you know, the, the ones that are going to record, the ones that are going to help you with your script. So it's about collaboration. It can also be about research because the content you present may be based on research. It's about access. You know? It's about uh, the strategy, the university strategy to increase the reputation and visibility and reach out to the world. So this is the beauty uh, of looking at um, of open education with the help of a framework, I think, you no, know? or the beauty of looking at digital competence with the help of a framework such as the G Compedu, because it helps us think through of a number of things, you no, know? and self-assess and reflect regarding our own practice and our own understanding, and so that we can, you know, we can increase a step in our understanding of certain topics, you no. Know? So open education is about research, also the research dimension, open access, open data, open science of all sorts, you no, know? open laboratories to the community. In the access dimension, we talk about accessibility, not only access to making content available, but accessibility in terms of helping making the content more accessible to the visually impaired, the hearing impaired, you know, to students, for example, that cannot uh, move themselves very easily, so they access the course online. Actually, courses do not need to be necessarily MOOCs. No, they can be open online courses, but not necessarily they need to be massive. So this is something for us to think about. You no, know? they can be free, they can be open, they can be online. They do not necessarily need to be massive, so they can be MOOCs, but they can be free and open online courses. No, it's about technology use, and when it comes to technology, we can also reflect upon open source. You know, the FOSS movement, uh, free and open source software, FOSS. You no know? technologies that are open source, you no know, such as Moodle. Everybody knows Moodle, for example. You no, know? just to give an example. So when you think of these dimensions, you think of quality. You know, content that is released in open education needs to have quality, and it is quality. It is quality content as much as any other type of content used in face-to-face classes. You no, know? it's about leadership that can be bottom up or top down it can be that teacher that is interested in the topic starts developing a course content makes it available in the format of a blog in the format of a, a book an ebook and uh, put an, an open license on it or you know records a class to teach their teach their students and make this class available to all so it's about leadership bottom up leadership you know and then this type of leadership is very powerful because it can in a positive way contaminate an entire school an entire institution higher education institution a school you know and make others see the importance of the sorts of practices and wanting to learn if this leader, you no, know, we call them champions, you know, the, the leaders um, that come from a specific faculty, a specific subject area, a specific you no know, type of topic, or it can be a leadership uh, um, top-down coming from the directors, the rectors, the managers, the faculty deans, the school director. You no. Know? So the beauty of it is when both top-down and, and bottom-up leadership um, finds themselves, meets themselves um, themselves halfway and that becomes a very powerful um, tool you know for promoting open education a strategy as I said because we see and our research shows that every institution that has open education as part of their mission is much more successful uh, in implementing and in the results they get out of it they get more reputation more visibility 
um, or sharing knowledge transfer within the institution and outside the outside world specifically when this strategy is written on paper made available to all in a website for example communicated to all so everybody knows where they are coming from when they are talking about open education what it means what are the institutional strategies how they can get support you know and and things are clarified and so that's a very good and important starting point so if your institution your school it still does not have a strategy think about it and the open edu framework presents Towards the end, if you look at the, ax, uh, the annex of the framework, some um, um, questions to help you design a strategy for your institution or your school. Okay, so I think that when we look at this at this framework at these ten dimensions, you can think of how to interact with this framework. So you can, for example, think of your practices. Um, on the perspective of, from the perspective of these 10 dimensions, no? So how do I deal with technology? How open are my pedagogies? How accessible is my content? And do I think of accessibility when I produce content? You know, so you can really engage with the 10 dimensions or you can even start with one of them and, and try and go deeper. For example, the accessibility one I've just given as an example, no? Uh, do I really think of accessibility when I am creating content? You know, see, a simple practice is when you write something um, and you are um, putting, making it available to your learners or you are using a paper, a scientific paper, you can voice record it and make it available in a different format format you know that can even be helpful for people who want to study while they're driving they are in the train you know but also for the ones who need different types of sources to be able to study because of, because of some sort of uh, impairment for example no so that's it i always say that the frameworks are really a starting point they are there for you to work with them to help you think through to adapt them to translate them to change them to appropriate yourself you know uh, of the framework and, and feel, feel a co-owner. I think that's when frameworks become really a, a, a potent tool for us to make changes and to reflect on our own practices. So open education, as I said, is about creating opportunities to all learners, no? Uh, whether they're formally registered or not, whether they're open learners looking for reskilling, looking for upskilling, looking to know what is being taught at the universities nowadays, nowadays because they've left university a long time ago. So there are different types of learners out there that, that can benefit from open education practices. Now, open education also tries to or offers opportunities for us to, to bridge the non-formal with formal education. So many people start non-formally taking a MOOC or engage with open education resources. They like the course, they like the methodology of the university of that particular lecturer and then they decided to register on the course and then they get credits for that and so it really bridges you no know, the non-formal with the formal um, education sectors then it, you can also think about MOOCs open education resources but you can think about open pedagogies for example as cited in the in the video that we just seen we can think of quality we have to think beyond and change our mindset to really think beyond you know the usual discourse that we hear in terms of open education and think what else can be part of this movement of openness and why am I engaging with it or not? How open can I be? You know, because there is a degree of openness there that you can choose where to be. It depends on what you can do and what you are willing to do. You know? So you can be less open and more open in certain areas of that framework. And that's up to you to decide. And when institutions use this framework to reflect, it's extremely powerful because it helps them to set their own policies, right? Okay, so here's the definition of open education. It's a way of carrying out education, often using digital technologies, because we do not depend on digital technologies because the concept of open education is not new. If you think of the open universities, the open university of the UK, I think it was found, founded in 69, and it was about um, posted materials, no, uh, via normal post, you know, printed materials. Uh, so, but nowadays, <clears throat> The, the technologies really enhance the potential of dissemination no? and that's why it's mostly used uh, done via digital technologies then its its aim is to widen access and participation to everyone by removing barriers this could be for example financial barriers no <clears throat> or time 
related barriers. And making learning accessible, abundant, customizable for all. Um, it offers multiple ways of teaching and learning, building and sharing knowledge, so you can create different learning pathways. For example, you can collaborate with other institutions, collaborate internally in your organization with other educators, other teachers, collaborate with other schools in your region, collaborate nationally, collaborate internationally. So it's really about building, sharing, exchanging. I use resources, but I also give back to the community. I put back online some the resources I produce or the resources I improve. I tag them appropriately so that others can find them, so I make more findable resources. Now, it's about a series of practices that can help us be more open. And you can be an open educator, if you wish to, to a lesser or a more um, a level, no? so a degree higher degree uh, if you prefer to be a totally open educator, it's up to you. Okay, then you can find the theoretical background and the details of this framework in this report, Opening Up Education, published in 2016. There's also a short version of it in Spanish there available if you want. After that, we've produced the Practical Guidelines on Open Education for Academics report. It's a report focusing on academics or higher education, operationalizing a little bit those 10 dimensions with ideas for practices for academics. It's very interesting because if you look at the statements for self-reflection, which we've done for each of the dimensions of this framework, you can think of your practice. Now, the only difference is that this instrument, these questions are not online. And that's why we do not call it a tool in the same sense as the checking well, actually, parts of them are online now, and I'll tell you now, but the whole um, of this framework of these statements for self-reflection is not online. Uh, but it's there on paper, and you can use it to self-reflect. When we put them online, then it becomes a tool, no? an instrument that, by using a, a technological platform, becomes a tool, such as the self, uh, Selfie for Teachers and the Checking Tool. But some of the questions of this questionnaire have now been included in the checking tool for higher education institutions, right? So you will find the new version of the checking tool, which I'll show you in a minute, you'll find that includes some of these uh, self-reflection questions. Okay, so um, then we, we have also um, done research at a higher level you know, with the member states in the European Union then 28, you no, know, before the before the Brexit, uh, and we talk about Ireland. I put that on page 74 in case you're interested to see. Then in 2018, what sorts of national policies there were in Ireland in terms of open education? Also, we present those practices in all the 28 um, European uh, member states. Then showing what sorts of national policies they had and mapping them against the Open Edu framework to see if their policies are more related to content, to technology, to research. You'll see, for example, that everybody talks a lot, a lot about open science and many countries have policies on open science, but not all of them talk about open pedagogies, for example. No? Um, and um, there, there is one country there that has that touches upon has policies there touching upon the ten dimensions. But it's interesting to see sometimes how this varies from country to country. Okay, then if you're interested in professional development and you are working or expect to work in higher education, we have done a survey, a survey, no, sorry, a search, no, a research. Uh, to identify innovative practices for professional development for academics. So how can academics really think of their career progress and what, what do they do if they want to do something different? So we made a selection of case studies showing different practices uh, in different um, countries. And so if you're interested in seeing something new in terms of professional development, I invite you to have a look at these reports that are also available online. Another study that I had the pleasure to conceptualize and be the editor was the Blockchain in Education, which we published in 2017. The Blockchain in Education report was very well received internationally. It received a lot of media attention because the goal in there was really to explain in simple terms for a non-specialist audience what blockchain is. Because you may not know, you know, and you hear about it and you think of Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah. And what does, why does this matter to education? So we really try and explain those things. No, it's not only about Bitcoin. In fact... You do not need Bitcoin for that. So if you are interested in, in this report and you can see uh, its relationship with credentials, with micro-credentials, with diplomas, you know, new ways of issuing diplomas, with um, identities, with trust, there are a number of uh, important concepts and values that are explained 
in this report. So this is, this is a good report for you to start engaging with blockchain education. Then, the Compedu framework, the European framework for the digital competence of academics. Again, the goal is to uh, have a working definition of what digital competence is, what it means to be a digitally competent academic, no? so that you can start talking about competences. No? It was uh, developed for all education sectors covering six competence areas and six proficiency levels. So, <clears throat> um, it is an, uh, now turned into an online tool called Selfie for Teachers. Uh, pardon me, this is a checking tool. The, the, the GCOMPEDU turned into an online tool. Uh, it's called Selfie for Teachers, only for primary and secondary teachers. If you are interested in higher education and you want to go through the self-assessment, the self-reflection, not really an assessment, it's a self-reflection, you use the checking tool. I will put, uh, I will show you the links uh, where you can access in Spanish and in English. It's important. It's important to think of them as self-reflection tools and not self-assessment because we're not really evaluating. Uh, you're not being evaluated when you go through uh, these questions. You know, we're not measuring. There's no measuring mechanism that is evaluating you. How well can you use this tool? No, it's your perception of yourself. You know? Oh, I think that I am so-so, for example. Or I think that I am very good. You know, I create new apps, I can do this and that. So it's your own judgment about yourself based on your self-reflection, okay? So I think this is a very important point to emphasize here because uh, we cannot really assess people based on these tools. We have to bear in mind these are self-reflection tools, okay? Now, but the results you get, when you go through them, in the end, you get a report that shows you, you know, your, your perceived level of competence. And then you can do things with it, you know. You can decide and talk to your um, head of department, director of school, um, to see what sorts of poss possibilities you would have for uh, further developing your digital competences, how, if you have help for courses, professional development, or you may decide to talk to other colleagues that can do some of those things better so you learn from them informally, or you can go and look for MOOCs, look for open online courses, look for open resources, uh, and, and do it for yourself. So there are many different ways in which you can use these results coming from the reports um, from the self-reflection that you can use to your own professional path. You can also join the GCOMPEDU community. The GCOMPEDU community is open to all. You can search for it in a search engine. Uh, and there we put news, we put links to um, academic papers, and it's an interesting community for you to get informed. So you are invited to join, okay? Now, the checking tool for higher education is a tool that we have focused and further developed and revised and validated Focusing for Higher Education. This work was done in 2021. We published it and made it available online and now in 2022, so it's pretty new. And it includes not only the GCOMPEDU six competency areas, but a seventh area called Open Education based on the Open Edu framework with some questions based on the Open Edu framework. So initially we had 22 questions, no? Uh, on based on the GCOMPEDU uh, framework and now we have 25 questions in the checking tool because we included some uh, based on, on the Open Edu framework for higher education institutions. These are the links for you to join and go through the self-reflection both in Spanish and in English up to you. Um, okay, now interesting outcomes from the checking tool. We have validated it formally uh, we have revised, we have carried out psychometric analysis, we've done pilots. So for the checking tool for higher education is a validated instrument. Now we have also applied it in seven countries in Latin America, actually six in Latin America and Portugal, so Ibero-America. It was very interesting to see how the universities, the level of digital competence of university teachers is very similar to Spain. Um, and it's um, you, can, you have a link to the webinar in which we present the results of this study. And we have written a scientific paper that is um, about to be published um, telling you the details of this experience in Ibero-America. Then, also important, a national initiative in Spain that we are publishing just now, a full report, now in May 2022. Uh, it took us four years to carry out uh, the whole study involving 53 universities in Spain. Uh, first of all, with a pilot of 500 teachers, and then we have more than 5,000 academics 
responding to this too. The Iberoamerica study had more than 30,000 lecturers participating. So they are really, really big studies, no? That help us and, and use this tool and understand the results and, 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 and try and see the differences in digital competence level, whether age has um, any interference, you know, if you're an older academic and a younger academic, uh, if you are a woman, if you're a man, um, if whatever, you know, if a gender has any interference uh, or if you are a senior uh, professor or someone who's just starting. So it's really interesting to see the results and we are about to publish this also. Now, in fact, we've won a, a prize for this work uh, that we carried out with Spain. Um, when I say we, I say the, the JRC, and I, I had the pleasure to, to, to be given the actual prize to, to keep it, no? and I have it here. <laughs> I have it here in my office. Um, and uh, it was very nice to, to, to receive this award you know, from CRUE, which is the Conference of Rectors of Spanish Universities, the Association of Spanish Universities. Because of this collaboration and because of this work that we've done over four years, they helped us to revise the frame or the, the, the checking tool for higher education. And it's a beautiful study that we've done in Spain. We are also publishing the methodology of this study so that it can be replicated in other countries um, if they wish to. Okay. Now, you may be familiar with this design, you know, with this graphic representation of the GCOMPEDU framework with its six dimensions, you no, know, its six areas. One of them that we do not normally talk much about is the assessment one, but it's very interesting. It's important to think of assessment as an important area, you know, uh, what sorts of strategies we use. You know, if we zoom in too, we can see the 22 competences there. You no, know? So assessment strategies, how we analyze evidence. So for each of these areas, what we what is discussed in the framework and also if you remember um you are familiar for sure with the um, language framework you know, that for competence assessment from A1 to C2. So it's mirrored in there in this, in this um, framework. So you can have, for example, an A2 competence level in, in digital resources and a B2 in area six facilitating learners' digital competence. It's also about, what I find beautiful in, about this framework is that it thinks about the learners. You no, know? it's not only about the teacher, it's also about the learners, how to empower them, how to facilitate their learning and their improvement of digital competences. So it's really nice. And then I just wanted to show you that if you are involved with a higher education institution, if you are a lecturer or you think you'd like to work in higher education institutions, then this tool is specifically for them as at an institutional level, not at an individual level. It's hate to innovate. It's a tool developed by the commission, the OECD, with eight areas for innovations for, for higher education institutions to think through how innovative they are. No? So you can think about leadership and governance, knowledge exchange and collaboration, measuring impact. So you go through all these areas and then you reflect and, and, and create your own policies based on, on this reflection. Okay, and I want to finish obviously with Bernard Shaw for a reason, no? Irish, um, that uh, with this saying, the reasonable man, this phrase, no, that he... he he left us with. The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable man persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. I find this a very, very interesting uh, uh, phrase from Bernard Shaw. And um, I really think that we should really try and be unreasonable as much as we can, you know, in order to try new things, uh, in order to to be creative, in order to to find new paths, to to be role models for others, or even just to improve our own practices, no, to the extent it is possible. So I'd like to thank you enormously um, for your attention, and I'm available to talk to you online. My Twitter is at AI Santos. You have my email. Thank you for the opportunity of sharing some of our research and um, that's it. Bye-bye.